All right, let's get started. We could. All right, let me just switch windows. All right, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Benford's Law and Percentiles. Um, and I think that's all I have in here. Um, so first and foremost, so the project, uh, next project is going to be released on Tuesday, the 8th. Um, and then on the 15th is the first checkpoint on the 22nd, which is the basically the day before Thanksgiving recess uh, is the second checkpoint. And then it's actually due on the 29th, which I think is the Friday after you get back from Thanksgiving. Um, couple of notes. So uh, I changed all this round. So basically I, I shifted the project was supposed to be released actually today, um, but I shifted it out till Tuesday. There is a homework released today. Um, so go check for that. It should be available right now. Um, and that is due, uh, you know, a week from today. So uh, next Thursday. Um, and then the theoretically the syllabus is now correct. So it has the rest of the homeworks and labs and that kind of stuff for the rest of the semester. Um, and when project two is due, et cetera. Uh, the other thing is grade scope and Blackboard should be fixed up. So it should be accurately reflecting um, the, you know, kind of your current status in the class. If you're still seeing an issue, uh, for example, we had a student who uh, was getting nothing in Blackboard at all, and it was just complete Fs all the way across. So that was no fun for them, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, but we fixed that one. So if you have anything weird, you know, whatever, feel free to reach out. Um, I said it's pretty manual to make sure the data stays in sync. Uh, so sometimes it just gets missed. Um, oh, there is a lab for tomorrow uh, during the discussion section. Um, and I tried to indicate those on the syllabus as well. I think there's like one more lab. Uh, and then there's like a, you know, if you have questions on the project is one of the discussions. And then uh, there's basically the final review. There might be one other lab, I can't remember now, um, but you can find it on Piazza, it's been updated. Uh, but yeah, kind of mind blowingly, I think we only have like five weeks left of the semester. Um, so the very last day of the semester is a Monday. We actually do have a homework due that day because we don't have a lecture the following day, obviously, because that's when like classes will be over on the Monday, but it will be due on that final day of classes uh, just so that I could fit in one more um, because I know how much you all enjoy homework. So I wanted to make sure you had the opportunity to do more of it. Uh, any questions? Did I miss anything? Oh, yeah. Uh, you should use the same group. Um, you know, if that's a challenge or whatever, uh, see myself or Rohan uh, about it. Um, but the idea is that you know, the group was kind of the same group throughout the, the whole semester. If for whatever reason your group has dwindled or grown, uh, that would be another reason to see us, uh, you know, to make sure that you have, I can't remember when we finally decided on three, I think, um, people in your group. Um, and make sure you submit it as a group as well. Uh, one of the problems with somebody's grades was that they weren't actually submitted as part of the group, so they had a zero, uh, even though they worked on it with a group. So uh, if you have any trouble, like I said, let us know. It's due a week from today. What day is today? Thursday? Thursday. Yeah. Uh, it says it, it should say it in the syllabus and be right. Um, asking me questions like that relies on me having any idea what day of the week it is or the date, which I usually don't. So uh, that's why I wear a watch because it usually tells me. Any other questions? All right. One of these days I'll get to the point where I can just set the whole syllabus up as a Google Calendar, but it's very, very manual. I've tried it before. All right, moving on. So uh, we have a, a internal debate going on. Um, all right, so the question is, if there was a class offered about blockchain or cryptocurrency, you know, kind of by the CDS organization, uh, would you be interested in taking it? But before you answer that, 
Who here raise your hand if you know what a blockchain is? Okay, not necessarily mathematically, but at least in theory. All right, so blockchain is basically, you can prove that these transactions took place because cryptographically, it signs the transaction before. So you know the whole history of, of the blockchain uh, and each of the transactions is a block. Cryptocurrency, anybody here know what a cryptocurrency is? Anybody want to explain what a cryptocurrency is? Yeah. Unmonitored. Yeah, so it's, it's basically some Yahoo decided, hey, I'm gonna start offering uh, this thing as a currency um, and you can decide to believe it or not. Okay, how many people here think that the US dollar is valuable intrinsically? Does the US dollar actually have a value besides the paper it's printed on? My leading question, come on. No, it does not. Okay, not for many years. It used to be backed by what's called the gold standard, right? But we haven't had that in a long time. So the value of a, the US dollar is what all of you collectively, and when I say all of you, I mean the entire world, thinks its value is, okay? Cryptocurrencies actually are the same way. And so I give a talk in one of my other classes about, you know, baseball cards. Anybody here ever collect like baseball cards or any other kind of cards? Um, garbage Pail Kids comes to mind as well. Um, those have value based on how much other people want it. They don't actually have any value intrinsically, right? Currencies are the same way. So there's actually nothing invalid about a cryptocurrency. It's just whether or not everybody believes it, or like in the case of Bitcoin, randomly one day, everybody stops believing it's valuable. And then the next day they believe it's valuable again, which is kind of hard on your income, right? So how many people would take it? Uh, show of hands. Uh, I said, uh, yeah, I actually said 100%, but it looks like about 90%. So we'll, we'll call it there. Um, all right, well, thank you for... Uh, uh, solving an internal bet, which none of us actually believed was a question in any way, but nonetheless, people were debating. All right, moving on to real stuff. More on p-values. Okay, so the p-value, the cutoff, okay, and note the word cutoff, for the p-value is an error probability. If your cutoff is 5% and the null hypothesis happens to be true, then there's about a 5% chance that your test will reject the null hypothesis, okay? So in other words, 5% of the time, you will get something that is at odds with the null hypothesis, okay? So the p-value cutoff versus the p-value itself. So the p-value cutoff is the cutoff for where it, the, you consider the p-value useful, okay? So if your cutoff is 6% and your p-value is Sorry, if your cutoff is 5%, your p-value is 6%, it's not useful. So you didn't get a useful result if you established your p-value. So as you may have done in some earlier like science class, right? It's important to kind of set your criterion for your experiment before you execute the experiment, okay? So that's where the cutoff comes in is that before you do the experiment, you say, we're gonna believe that a cutoff of 5%, which is pretty typical, um, we did that in a lecture or two ago. We call that statistically significant by convention. That's about 5% versus 1%, which is highly statistically significant. So that would be your cutoff, okay, um, in this case. But your actual p-value might be, let's say, 4%, okay? So, uh, so it's just kind of important to, to know what the difference is between the two. Um, and yeah, that's it. All right. Question. All right, so uh, which of these does not depend on observed data or simulation? Decide on it before seeing the results. Conventional values are 5% 1% and the probability of a hypothesis testing making an error. Well, that last one could probably be slightly better phrased. Is that the p-value or the p-value cutoff? I would really like the in-room camera to work again, but every time I come in here, it has been moved again. All right, get those answers in, let's close it up. All right. Our responses looks like largely correct. 
So this is describing the cutoff. Although this last one probably could be phrased slightly differently now that I read it again, um, because it's really like within the probability, right? Because the P value may not be equal to the probability cutoff, or sorry, the P value cutoff. Um, it might be, you know, less. If it's over, then it doesn't meet the cutoff. All right. Here's another question. Look at that. So error probability and the cutoff for P value is the same. All right, get those answers in. All right, so this one, well, technically, this is another one that might be phrased a little bit better. So once the p value meets the cutoff, you usually just refer to the cutoff. So as a result, the error probability is usually just the cutoff. So I might edit this question and say they're both right, uh, kind of. Okay. So in common practice, true is correct. Okay. In like technical detail, it's not quite true. Does that make sense? All right. So this is something called Benford's Law. Has anybody ever heard of Benford's Law? If you were paying attention to politics in the last presidential election, um, it was a big drama. All right, well, if you weren't paying attention to the last US election and you are American, you should be paying attention to this one, which is next Tuesday. If you didn't already vote, you should. Voting is important. Uh, I also can't switch windows. Um, so, First, we're going to demonstrate it. Then we're going to talk about it in theory. All right. So Benford's law, basically what Benford's law says is that there is a higher probability that, uh, you know, if you get a, bu a bunch of numbers, that those numbers will start with one, then they will start with nine. Okay. And I think this is super fascinating. Um, so let me run this. Then again, I'm easily amused. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define Benford's model, which uses some math that we haven't really played around with too much. Um, but basically, it's going to create a set um, with, the, with the correct distribution that we've been kind of playing with before. But I'll kind of show it to you as a picture to make it a little simpler. So the probability of getting a one as the first digit, if you take a whole bunch of numbers, is about 30%, okay? And as you can see, it steps down from there, right? So this is mathematically proven. So this is true under some conditions. And those conditions are primarily that the set of numbers has to be large, okay? Uh, and if it's not, or the numbers have to be large themselves, okay? And if it's not, it doesn't always work as well. So. This is, um, and so by way of example, well, first of all, we're gonna write a little function that's gonna help us test this to see if we believe it. So can anybody tell me how I could go about getting the first digit in a number? position and how, how would I do that if I have a number yeah. that would be kind of one way that I, I'm talking about kind of the simpler part of it is like if I have a number there's no indexing into it right so how do I make it so that I can index into a number I could that would be a very long slow way to do it but it would work Exactly, turn it into a string. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn it into a string 
by doing str num. Okay, and then to your earlier point, we're going to take the first position, but then we actually want it to be back as a number, right? So we're going to convert it back to an int afterwards. Um, you forgot we're lazy. So we have to have tricks so that we don't have to actually do work and math. Um, so this will give us a little function that will tell us what's the first digit in any number that we give it to it, we give to it. Uh, so for example, I should get a three here eventually. Um, and here I should get a one, right? So it's just gonna give us back the first digit every time. So we're going to now error. Oh, I forgot I have question marks in here. Um, okay, so the first thing we're gonna do, let me actually just show, yeah, that's why I have this comment to the help. Oops. Oh my goodness, come on, really? I'm just going to show it to you this way rather than the way I described to myself. Um, but as you can see, so this table has a whole mess of columns. Okay. And let's say the only columns I want to use are, let's see, um, state, county, and I think it's, it's just called population. No, we want, and let's see. Yeah, we have, we want pop, population estimate 2010 for the sake of this experiment. So in my little question mark here, um, what would I typically put there to get just those columns? Their names. But there's an easier way to do it, especially when the names are long and you're lazy. So you can actually, and this is why I didn't know what it was off the top of my head from reading my notes, um, is I can just put the position of the columns that I want, okay? So just make sure your positions are correct, right? So zero, one, two, wait, what? <laughs> do I have the right columns? Did I just miscount? I'm very good at that. Um, so let's see if we end up with the right thing. I do end up with the right thing. All right, well, long story short, it's just the column position. Um, and that way you can just grab it without having to get the names right. Um, I'm way likely to have a typo. Um, and normally I can count correctly, but apparently not today. Um, However, I have off by one errors all the time. So now we have a table that just has the state, the county, and the population. And so we're going to play with Benford's law here. Okay. And so if we want to present, let me make sure I'm looking at the right thing. So if we want to get, let's say, a new column with just those first digits so that we don't have to calculate it every time, right? So one of the things we're often trying to do when we're doing this stuff is we want to make things more efficient. So instead of trying to calculate the first digits of all the counties' populations each time, maybe I'll just do it once and then kind of store it on the table directly. So then I have it when I want to do further manipulation later. Does that make sense? Okay. So how would I go about getting the first digit of each population in the table? So like, what's the method I would use? Oh no, yeah. Uh, that'll give you, that'll give you rows. It'll give you certain rows. What I wanna do is I want the first digit off of an entire column. Any other ideas? Apply. Apply, yes. And apply what? Oops. Uh, first yeah. There's some question marks. Okay, so that's going to give us an array with just the first digits based on the population. 
Then I'm going to take that array and shove it into the table in a column called first digit, right? And so you see it's now five, right? One, two, ad infinitum. All right. And so I don't know why I have this number rows here because it's actually just 31, 39 plus 10, right? Or no, plus three. Um, but, oh, sorry, I need it later. I thought I was displaying it. Um, so now what I want to do is basically visually check my existing or, you know, what I know Benford's law says it should be, okay? And the counties that I looked at, okay? And I think this is correct. So what I can do is just create a bar chart that has both sets right by taking my first digit column right and my and basically doing the proportion of those columns or of those uh, first digits and then displaying it in a new table with the benford model that we did before Good gracious um and so we can see how we did okay and so one of the things that i want to kind of point out here Actually, maybe I will open the CSV. Um, so if you look at the difference between this number and uh, the one immediately above it, which I don't know if I can select them both, uh, of course. So, so like when we look at these two, not only are they pretty big numbers, but there's what's called an order of magnitude difference in those numbers. So we have a lot of changes in orders of magnitude. So in other words, like how many digits is it? Okay. And if there's not a lot of variability between them, like if they don't, if they don't have enough of a range, Benford's law won't work. Okay. So it's pretty limited, but it's kind of useful when you're looking at, say, for example, a census population, it kind of gives you an idea of where they should be, okay? Um, and whether this is a good way to like test your data. So if you dump this into all the counties and your grid, or I'm sorry, and your history, uh, bar graph didn't end up looking something like this, then maybe that means there's something wrong with your data, okay? Because it should, if you look at the county's data, you can tell that there's a lot of orders of magnitude change between all the different numbers. Does that make sense? So it's just a, kind of another way that you can kind of cross check your data or, you know, kind of later on, we can also use it maybe to make predictions or, or try to make predictions. Or the example we're gonna give is, can it be used to detect fraud? Okay. So, what we're gonna do to, oh yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's log ten of the digits, basically. I don't know if I can. Um, and I think we draw it again, or we talk about it more on the slides too. Um, I think. Uh, so, in order to test this, right? So. We see that it's kind of close, but it's not always right, right? So, but we have the same problem here. So we want to think about how can we test this to see if it's good or not. Um, and so we're going to first create a null hypothesis, right? The distribution of county populations follows the Benford's law and the distribution of the county populations does not follow Benford's law. And so what do we think the test statistic should be? And I tried to leave this as question marks for you so you could write it down if you wanted. And then while you're thinking about that, the, do we want higher values of the test statistic, which will favor the alternative, or is it lower values of the test statistic favors the alternative? Okay, so you got to think about both what kind of statistic do you want to use, and then like how do you read it, right? It's like, you know, do you want a higher test statistic or a lower test statistic, test statistic uh, to get it to be like with the alternative, for example. All right. What do y'all think we should use? Maybe 
ideas. So this goes back to the lecture we did last time of kind of looking at this is I uh, what did I call it here? Just we use the same language. So we have two categorical distributions. And what we want to know is how far apart they are, right? Because we have, um, yeah, so how, how far apart are these things? Because the categorical distribution is like how, what are those uh, first digits, right? Because that's not, they're not really numbers anymore, right? They're just digits. They're just like a category. You know, we have certain counties that are in the one category, certain counties that are in the two category. So which test statistic do we use to compare Benford's model to the categories of counties? Yeah. Uh, but the statistic is, I'm trying to remember what I wrote. Um, so it's the it's the total variation distance. Is that the, what it says kind of further on in that same bullet? Okay. Um, so basically, when we're looking at two categorical distributions, we can't kind of compare them like apples to apples per se. So that's why we use the total variation distance because we can say, hey, we have this distribution over here and we have this distribution over here. So we can actually look at how far apart they are to kind of say, okay, this Benford's model, which is measuring we don't know what, right? And we have the counties in grouped into categories. So now we can say, hey, how far apart are those two distributions from each other? And that's what we do with the TVD. Um, and so anybody have an idea of whether, now remember, so which, which way is it gonna be, do we want a bigger number for the alternative to be true? Or do we want a smaller number for the alternative to be true? And remember the alternative in this case is the county populations do not follow Benford's law. Right, so we want a bigger number, right? If we want the alternative to be true or whatever. I mean, that's the way it's gonna work. Um, oops, I thought I was scrolling the other window. Okay, so in order to get the TVD, how do we calculate the uh, total variation distance? Remember from last time? Ideas, anyone? All right, so we'll start off with, we're just gonna subtract the two from each other, okay? All right, but now what do we wanna do here, right? Like, what do we wanna do? Because we want distance, not direction. Absolute value. And then, we're gonna um, try to even it out. And so what we're gonna do is essentially is add those up so that we kind of end up with one number, right? Um, but because we added them all together, right? Because remember, this is two arrays. So when we do that subtraction, oops, I forgot the absolute value. Um, we actually get two more arrays. So we wanna kind of crash those arrays into like one number, okay? So now we have the subtraction, right? But it's two arrays. Now we've gotten rid of the negative sign. So now we know it's just distance. That's what the absolute value does. But then we're going to sum it so that we can turn that result into like one number. Um, but then we're going to divide it by two to kind of offset the fact that we, we summed it up. All right. So we end up with an observed um, total variation, dis a variation distance um, of a pretty small number. Right, it's just you know it's it's about one or a point zero two, which means that we think they're probably pretty close. However, essentially, what we did was we took one sample, right? It happens to be the real sample, but that doesn't necessarily tell us that all the counties in the future will stay that way, right? So what we want to do is actually simulate it so that we can say. Okay, we observed it once in the real world with this, you know, result, and we end up with a very, they're very close. However, 20 years from now, will they still follow Benford's law? We don't know, right? Because all we have is this one point in time. Probably, right? There's a good chance, but we really don't know. 
So we're going to take and we're going to actually do some sampling to basically simulate what it might look like in 20 years or 20 years ago. And so what we do is now we use our sample proportions that we were doing before um, to get to what the proportions we're looking for are or the, the, the values. Um, and then we can actually simulate it a bunch of times. But first, oops, let's just calculate our TVD again. Make sure I didn't miss anything else. Right, so here's kind of doing it once. But in fact, we want to make it as an array, uh, sorry, a function so that we can call it a whole bunch of times. And then kind of just like we've been doing all the way along, we're going to now run it a bunch of times and we're just going to keep appending the result to our kind of uh, collector. And we're going to say simulated DVDs and our new function up here, which I don't remember if I ran or not. Okay. So now in simulated TVDs, I should have um, a whole bunch of runs of pretend sets of counties, but following that same distribution they had originally. And I feel like I have a bug because that looks too straight. What am I doing wrong here? Let me make sure I actually ran these things again. All right, so we should be sampling the proportions. And we have our function. It's still coming out the same. Well, <laughs> funnily enough, it's working. It's just that I don't believe it, right? Because I, I expect to see a histogram, right? Because it's not going to come out perfectly every time. And this is coming out perfectly, which makes me think I did something wrong. Um, I just can't figure out what it is. Let me just Oh, yep, I had a bug. So instead of using the thing I'm creating each time, I was using the fixed one before. So I, I ran 10,000 times of the exact same thing. So that's why it didn't work. Okay, so <laughs> now this is looking better, right? Our array is a little bit more all over the place. And now we should have a histogram that looks a little bit more reasonable. Okay, so when we simulate it, so, if you notice, though, it's not perfect, right? Because what we what we want it to be is is zero, right? But it's not going to be. It's just going to be close. So as a result, though, we can make a pretty good guess that in this case, let's see, if we get. So we can kind of make a pretty good guess that the null hypothesis in this case is probably true, okay? Because our null hypothesis up here was that it follows Benford's law. And so what we wanted, if the alternative was true, was a bigger number. But if we want the null to be true, then a smaller number. And so we can kind of see it here. This is also showing it, but I, to be honest, I think it shows it less well. Um, but I like the histogram. So as you can see, right, it's a relatively small number. Most of the times we ran the same. Does that make sense? So what you got to do is like, yes, you have an observed statistic. That's great. But that's actually not enough to say it's true. You need to observe it, right? Like in this case, we observed it 10,000 times. 
We don't actually want to observe it 10,000 times because that's too difficult. So instead, we simulate observing it 10,000 times. Okay? And the different types of simulation are appropriate to basically different types of, you know, how much observed data you have, the kind of observed data you have, so that you can make a good simulation based on that data, right? Because if you have, for example, like five examples, simulating it this way may not work as well because maybe it's gonna, there's not gonna be enough randomness. There's not gonna be, or there's gonna be too much randomness. So you gotta think about the, you know, which problem are you trying to solve and then apply the appropriate way of simulating it. And hopefully, you know, hopefully you'll get those kind of from the lectures, but also, this is where we practice them in the homeworks. And then, you know, somewhere before the final exam, there'll be, a, you know, kind of a, a sheet. Like that's kind of what I was showing in the last lecture. It's like, you have this scenario, you have this kind of data, this is what you should be using. Right? And it's kind of like a lookup table. All right. So as we can see from up here, more, like I said, I think it's better than the other one. Um, it does seem that it's consistent with the null hypothesis. So, let me change pages for me. There we go. All right. So, first thing before we kind of move into the like real example of Benford's law, um, this is a pullout quote from a real, I think it was a, let's say social media post. I can't remember what social media platform it was. I want to say Facebook, but it could have been Twitter. Um, probably not Instagram because there's not enough pictures of cats. Um, so, but what I want to point out here is a few things about the text. Okay. So, when you read this, do you think that they're trying to convince you of something or are they trying to make a statement of fact? Right? Like, are they, are they trying to, you know, convince you by adding color, color, um, or are they, uh, you know, just trying to lay out the data they have and whether that convinces you or not, that's fine. This is a bit of a leading question. What do you think? Right. So they're trying to convince you, right? So my next question is, what about this, right? Makes you realize that they're trying to convince you versus just making a statement of fact. Because they're stating that there's like a difference between like Okay, so so that's kind of the conclusion you're drawing from the actual words. There's actually stuff just directly, like if you look at it on the face of it without even reading it that tells you that this is trying to make a, a you know an argument rather than present facts. Do you, any of you see any of that? This is a common technique used uh, for various types of propaganda. Right, so some of the words are in red, right? To draw your eye, okay? Any other things like that? Right. So I didn't really kind of mention that one, but that's one too, which is where like where you where you could have said Biden fails an accepted test, right? They added this color here to make the fail worse. Right. So that's another that's another trick, right? Is you use lots of adjectives. Any other ideas? There's another one, it's another really simple one, like the color. That, that is one that uh, that's kind of, I would say, in the same vein, uh, vein as the pretty clearly in that, uh, and I kind of talk about it on the next slide, what analysts, right? Like who, right? What, are they certified? Do they have some sort of like standing? Like what is an analyst? You know, somebody walking by, right? But there's something even, even less complex than that.
it's also just bad writing. Um, it's actually really kind of simple in the weird capitalization, right? So there's capitalization in here that doesn't belong, again, to draw your eye, okay? Does anybody know why contracts are often written in all caps? You know, like parts of a contract will be written in all caps or part of a law, for example? Kind of, so, you know, yes, that often is the result, but if it's in all caps, you actually slow down, you can't read it as fast. And so you tend to focus more on what it actually says. You'll actually parse it because it's so much more difficult to read for you. You actually parse it more closely. Um, so similar trick is being used here with capitalization to get you to kind of slow down and notice certain phrases. Okay. So the point being is that, so you, here's your some analysts right there, like who right there, um, you know, and then why are those highlighted or in red, you know, depending on the, the color choice. Um, violate, which is here, like why is that capitalized, right? It's not the end of a sentence. Um, you know, arguably vote too, but that could be Biden's vote as in a proper noun together. Um, and then this one is particularly interesting, the accepted test for catching election fraud, accepted by who? Like, does anybody know what the accepted test is for election fraud? Well, nobody knows because it doesn't exist. Um, so these are the kinds of things that you should be looking for when you're, you know, if you kind of see this kind of text. It, one of these things where there's random colors and random capitalization immediately should put you on your guard, right? Like you're immediately like, oh, there's something fishy here, right? Because especially the color thing, right? Because you have to go to extra effort to get the color to you. So that was it, just a little bit of sidebar, um, but it kind of was one of the many exemplars of this problem. So uh, during the election or just after the election, uh, there was um, supposition that uh, the votes for Biden were uh, fraudulent or many of the votes for Biden were fraudulent. Um, and because, oh, and so for background, right? In Milwaukee, this is a city, 70% um, of the votes were for Biden. Mind you, cities tend to be uh, vote blue or blo vote Democratic. So it's actually not that surprising that an entire or most of a city would vote for the Democratic candidate. But for sake of this argument, 70% in this particular city voted for Biden. Half of all the wards have total votes from about 570 to 1,200. So a ward is kind of the smallest unit of voting you're, yeah, kind of the smallest unit of voting. I think I've talked about it before, but you live in a ward and that's where your votes are tallied. Um, and the logarithmic average or the mean is about 800, okay? So in other words, when you look at the, the, the logarithmic average, which is similar to a regular average, but it's between 570 and 1200, is actually 800. The US is essentially a two-party system at the national level. If you're not familiar with American politics, any, any candidates in a third party is, ridiculously unlikely to win. So essentially it's a two part, it's a two person race, okay? At the, for the presidency at least. So this is the graphs of their votes, okay? And down here we have um, the leading digits, okay? Uh, I know it's super fuzzy, but that's why I try to put some labeling in, but leading digits. And then up here we have the frequency of those leading digits in a, by ward, okay? So the argument is that Trump's who's second on over and these other, what, four are, are other candidates. So they do run, but even though the graphs look similar in size and stuff, the actual vote counts in these are, are ridiculously small. So they're, they're not worth noticing, but for completeness sake, all of them is here, okay? So the argument is that because this looks the same as the Benford's distribution, that this must be voter fraud because it doesn't, right? And going by our example just now, that seems plausible, right? And I'll show you why it's not. So is this an indication of voter fraud? And I think this thing is super interesting. That's why I kind of uh, get into it a little bit. Um, and the reason is no, or the, the answer is no. Um, and so what I'm gonna ask you is kind of why, right? And to do that, just going to put the graph back up. So any theories about why this is not indicative of voter fraud? 
And the kicker is in one of those bullets that I listed as in the background. All right, let's give, let's give everybody a couple seconds. Any other ideas? Anybody got any ideas? I've been dating myself on pop culture movies this week. Is my point? So Bueller, um, I don't want to, I don't want to buy anything. I don't want to sell anything. Does that make sense? Say anything? The movie say anything? No. Same same genre and kind of as like Sixteen Candles. Um, another one of the same series of movies. Same director, I think. Uh, okay. So what's your idea? Mm -hmm. So it's not that the sample is small, it's that so so you're both correct, but the the reason is because the there's none of that um uh orders of magnitude difference. Because remember how the words only vary between 570 or whatever it was in 1200? So in other words, we have to have a 570 ward and a five, you know, or a 10,000 ward, okay? To get orders of magnitude difference in order for Benford's law to work, okay? So immediately that's suspicious. So in fact, but you're kind of getting at my point here too, is that um, if you take 70% of 800, so that logarithmic average, um, most of the starting numbers should be fives, okay? So fours and, or, you know, fours and sixes, right? So kind of right around five. Um, but if you take 30%, which was Trump's side of that vote, then you would expect ones and threes or one, twos and threes. And if you kind of go back to the images, that's actually what you do see here, right? Because of the size of the award, you expect the distribution if 30% if of the vote voted for Trump that they, he would mostly have one, twos, and threes to make the math work. And that Biden would have mostly, you know, three through five or whatever, or uh, sorry, four through six. We have this little weird outlier, but, you know, so in fact, it doesn't apply because of the lack of uh, orders of magnitude difference. Um, but you kind of can actually look at it and it, in a sense, there are also sort of kind of actually proving that it's not fraud because of how the numbers worked out. Um, and so the reason I thought that was particularly interesting was, and that's a quote from one of these articles, but so depending on how you like to consume information, if you want to learn more about this, uh, here's a few articles. Uh, but then there was a Radio Lab. Anyone familiar with Radio Lab? Uh, they do a great podcast, all very interesting. Uh, the only time I ever listen to podcasts though is when I'm flying. Uh, and so I don't travel very much, so I don't listen to them much anymore. Um, but then there was also a Netflix documentary, so if you want video version called Digits, or an episode called Digits, I can't remember what the actual show was called, um, uh, that talks about this as well. Uh, so I just thought it was super interesting. But the reason I kind of beat this dead horse, two reasons. One, I really think it's interesting. Two, because like, Kind of like I was giving the examples before with the, you know, doing your sample, how you do your sampling depends on the nature of the problem. And if you use the wrong kind of sampling, it won't work. So Benford's law is a great example of in this, you know, very, you know, potentially very small box, this what we call use case in software engineering a lot. Um, it works great, right? But if you try to use it in something that doesn't fit in that box, if you ignore the tenets, okay? It's not going to work, and it may even lead you down the wrong conclusion. Um, one of these days, I'm going to learn how to talk to this side of the room, but I always talk to the left side of the room. I never know why. Uh, you, when I'm giving a conference talk, as much as when I'm giving a talk. All right. So, in fact, this is a counterexample, right, of Benford's law. This is a proof of you try to apply a set of rules that are only supposed to work under certain conditions and violate the conditions, it doesn't work. So everything is super slow today. All right, so moving on to percentiles, also very important. Um, and so 
this is kind of a, you know, kind of a gimme in the sense of what is the 80th percentile? The reason we talk about it is because it's not in common usage of the term percentile or whatever. We don't necessarily mean exactly the same thing. So the percentile is a number that exists in the set, okay? And so this is a set of numbers. So the 80th percentile, when we use the term percentile in this class, we mean it has to be a number that is one, three, five, seven, or nine. And it'll be the one that's the 80th percentile. And then the definition is, I think on the next slide. So the 80th percentile is the first value on the sorted list that is at least as large as 80% of the elements. In other words, the 80% of the elements. So the first thing we have to do is sort the list, okay? But then we can figure out using very easy math, right? What position we're looking for, okay? Uh, let me see. Yeah, so here it is kind of worked out. Um, so we get this initial set, then we sort it, then we say, okay, so the 80th percentile because of that is gonna be whatever the fourth element, right? Probably should have done that in terms of zero, but you get the idea. Okay, so it's just a little confusing because uh, I think maybe we talk about the next slide. It's just that typically when we talk about something that's like the 80th or whatever, we don't. It doesn't have to be in the set, right? But in this case, whenever we say that, we mean that number is in there. Okay, so what is the 50th percentile? And so in this case, it's the ordered element three. Um, because when we calculate it, it's two and a half and we round up to the nearest position. Okay, we don't round down, we go up and it has to be that one of the numbers in there. So therefore we get three. Um, and yeah, as it says down below, if for a percentile that doesn't exactly have a spot, then we go to the next one. Okay, because that prior rule of, you know, the 80th percentile, it's everything has to be below it. All right. So this is one of the reasons why it's often confusing is because the median may or may not be in the set. Okay. So I'm trying to remember where the next slide is. Um, so it's at the, you know, so the median when we're talking about it is the 50th percentile um, and 50% of the values and 50% of the value, uh, sorry, are above and 50% are below but sometimes it's not in the set, okay? So it's just the reason I kind of talk about this, right, is because the percentile is weird because it has to be in the set. Make sense? Okay, it's really straightforward. It's just that one weird caveat. All right, so what do you call something at the 50th percentile? First answer here killed me. Hopefully everyone here gets it. Otherwise I'm dating myself yet again. I try to use common in a question and nobody, nobody knew common was. I was very disappointed. All right, get those answers in. All right, and pretty good. So median, and just remember the median is the middle, the mean is the average, they're not necessarily the same. Uh, and so it's important. Why is the first one funny? Anybody know? Because he's 50 cent. All right, so, hey, this slide looks familiar. We talked about this one already. Um, okay, so, uh, conveniently enough, our little module has a function called percentile, which will give you the result that you want. Um, and let's look at a demo. All right, so we're just gonna, uh, it's checking the time. So we're just gonna make an array, uh, you know, kind of an arbitrary list of numbers so that we can uh, you know, kind of play around with this. 
And let me catch up with my cheat sheet. All right. So how can we sort this data? Can I guess? We have a convenient function. Yes. That's much harder. This is much easier. <laughs> uh, oops, I broke badly. Uh, so yeah, we just have an MP sort. Um, and so that just gives us the sorted set. Um, now, one of the other things I wanted to introduce you to, has anyone heard of mod or modulo? Does it ring any bells? You may know what modulo is when you talk about it in math. It gives you the remainder. Um, and so it's very common to use in programming. So as a result, we use a special symbol, um, which is pretty consistent across all languages and everything. Sometimes it'll literally be the word mod, but most of the time it's like this, it's a percent sign. Okay, so unlike a division, okay, it's kind of like a division with some extra stuff. Uh, so you use the percent sign and that means mod or modulo. Um, and I can't remember the last time I saw the word modulo, okay, except for teaching this class, like almost everyone always just refers to it as mod. So you would just say 2.2 .2 mod one. Okay, that's how you would read that. Um, and so it just kind of gives you the leftover bits, right? Uh, if you divided it and threw out, you know, it's like, you know, if you think about how you're doing, you know, if you were like, you know, very young doing division, when they first start you out, you get two pieces, right? You get the division and then you get whatever the remainder is. So this is just the remainder, okay? Um, and so we can use that for a bunch of different things. And so if we figure out where the 50th, 55th percentile would be, so we know that if we just do the division, we'll end up with not a very useful number here, right? To try to find it. So we kind of cheat and we do, um, first just kind of converting it to a number, uh, but an integer, sorry, converting it to an integer, not a, um, what do we call it? Not a float. Uh, and, but then if we're over it, right, we wanna make sure that we take the next one up, right? So that's why we have to do, we wanna round it, but then we need to check and see if our original number is greater than the rounded number, okay? And rounded is actually, it's not really rounded. This is really like lop off the, the right side, right? It's, it doesn't actually round it. So probably should change the variable name to be something more accurate. Um, so if in the case that it is greater, we're just gonna add one to rounded so that we can get to the next position. That makes sense, right? Because we need to make sure that whatever this is, whatever number that we're passing in, we wanna make sure that it's, it's, a, it's past, you know, equal to or past 55th, right? All right, so, and then we just have a little example. So we have our float position. So basically the actual kind of calculation, which ends up as 3.3. .3. Then we use our round up function here, which gives us a four back, right? Because three is less than 3.3. .3, so we're gonna take the next spot, right? And so that means that when we sort our array up here, then we're gonna grab that position. And so we end up with a 34, okay? That makes sense? So this is kind of a long way of doing the problem, but then we can also use that fancy, fancy mod function. Um, oh, actually, oh, I thought I did this with mod too. All right, so we're gonna do it another way, um, which is a little bit easier. Um, but also introduces you to another handy function. Um, make sure my friends are right. Okay, which basically gives us the exact same result, except instead of doing our rounded function up there, what we're gonna do is the equivalent of like leveraging the mod by just getting the ceiling, okay? So if you think of the number as, of an integer, it was 3.3, right? So the ceiling of that is four, and I 
I can't remember what MP uses. This is one of the ones that changes in different languages, but it's often floor. Okay, so if you think the three is the floor and the four is the ceiling, so 3.3, we want to go to the ceiling. Okay, but those are two handy functions, seal and I want to say it's floor. Um, but basically, you can do exactly the same thing without having to write your own. This is essentially writing your own ceiling function. All right, but what you should probably do in this actual use case is use the percentile function and get the answer that way. Okay, so this is just built in to the data science module, does the same thing uh, without all the work because lazy. All right, how are we going in time? Okay. Oh, question. All right, so basically fill in the blanks, except they're not like set up as blanks. So the pth percentile is the what value in a set that is what as large as p percent of the elements of the set. What is the correct pair of words to fill in the blank? So is it the pth percentile is the smallest value in a set that is at least as large as blah. Um, and the pth percentile is the, or the pth percentile is the largest value in a set that is at most as large as p percent of the elements. All right, we're not getting as far as I had hoped today, but all right, so smallest and at least um, hopefully at this point, you know why, but that was the correct answer. Um, so just kind of keep it in mind, like I said, primarily it's because it's different from colloquial English. Uh, and then we have a bunch more questions, except um, I'm gonna run them as top hat questions. So, if we have an array X, okay, so 1, 5, 15, 23, 29, um, what is the 10th percentile in that array? And it, is that equal to zero? Okay. All right, answers, a bunch more we need. All right, I'm gonna close them. All right, so somebody who said false, can you tell me why? And they know why it's not zero? Um, it's not zero because um, that should be the funnest percentile, not the 10th, right? So, so zero is like here, yeah. right? So the 20th percentile will be one, yeah. right? So why? So arguably, right, it's less than one. So why isn't it zero? Zero is not in the set. So you couldn't you couldn't get in there, right? Like you couldn't, there's no there's no spot there. All right, next one. Uh, thinking. All right, so same set um, now. Is the 40th percentile the same as the 39th percentile?
All right, get your answers in. All right. So the correct answer was true. Anybody who said true, can you explain why? Anybody? Yeah, basically. I mean, yeah, it was, it was like whether they're, yeah, so both the 40 and the 39 uh, percentage are, yeah, above one and below five. Um, I was trying to think of if that's, and I think I would phrase it that way. So, yeah, uh, it just takes me a minute to translate what you're saying to how I wrote it. Um, so, basically, it's just that same rule is that, um, you know, it's got to be at least as big, right? All right. Uh, there's two more, and then we'll call it a day. Um, so this one, 40th percentile versus the 41st percentile. Will they be the same value? All right, this is the same, very similar question to the one before. So get those answers in. All right, last chance, I'm gonna call it. Okay. And so it seems a little bit stickier there. So the answer is false. Okay, and in the interest of time, and it's just because when you get to 41, you kind of jump to the next one, right? You, you've now passed the five. So therefore the five is the one on the left and 15 would be the one on the right. And so therefore they're not equal, right? All right, last one. Uh, same set, is the 50th percentile equal to 15? All right, answers in. All right. And this is true. Um, conveniently, the 15 is also the median, right? So uh, 50th percentile lands very nicely in this set because it's an odd number uh, of items. And so it, it works out pretty well. Um, 